couple things I want to go through first to kind of set the stage before Mike and uh, Clark kind of give us their perspectives of their implementation. Um, in, in public sector, there's some real challenges, and some of you may have seen some type of variation of these slides uh, before, but there's a lot of pressures about doing more with less. And there's a real competition as to, you know, with funds and how they're being spent. And I, I get a lot of jurisdictions coming up to us and saying, gee, my maintenance bills on my uh, legacy software systems are so much. You know, wh why am I paying so much money for, for this stuff? And uh, so the good news is that users out here are looking to say, how can I more effectively spend my money uh, with, with software vendors? You know, from a citizen's perspective, and integrating with technology, you know, almost every home now in, in your communities, you know, folks are on the internet. They're used to being able to go out to, uh, you know, uh, Amazon.com and buy things or pay, pay for things with PayPal and so forth. So they wonder, well, why can't I do that same type of business with government? Why can't I pay my bills online? Why can't I see what types of services are being provided to me? Another thing is that a lot of governments and uh, public sector um, organizations are using uh, outdated systems, uh, whether they're old mainframe systems or even systems they put in five or six years ago where they spent lots of money to put systems in, but they're really not getting the value back out of, out of, out of the solution. And then the other challenge that public sector organizations have is, a ch is the changing workforce. And actually, when I first did this slide, I put the aging workforce, and then I realized they're talking about me. So, um, but, but whether, whether it's, it's an aging workforce where you've got employees that are running some of the old systems and uh, they're the only ones that have that knowledge of how the system works and everybody's fearful that, gee, when is Sam or Mary going to retire or our system's going to continue to work? But the other challenge also, too, is as you're hiring new uh, employees to come into your organization, you have you know, what I call the, the digital children. Like uh, I, I heard Steve Ballmer the other day say, you know, when he calls his, his kids, they never answer the phone. He leaves them a voicemail. They never pick it up. The only way they respond is via texting. And the same thing happens with my kids, and you all can, can all probably relate to that. So it's a new generation as to how folks like to interact with systems. And you have to think about that as you're bringing in new employees into your workforce, is that they want to do things a different way. You know, they certainly don't want to sit down and say, they get out of college, they come into your organization, and they see a green screen and say, what is this? You know, they're, they're totally lost. So how, how does Microsoft deal with that challenge? Well, with AX 2012 for public sector organizations that we released last summer, um, we said we want to make a difference in how we're providing solutions uh, to government. And we did a couple things. Number one is, you know, traditionally when folks look at ERP solutions, they bought a module to say, well, gee, do I buy procurement? I get financials or I get HR. And the philosophy behind Microsoft was, why not provide all the tools to an organization? So in essence, what we've done with AX2012 is we bundle everything together. So we're not charging by individual modules or you don't have someone coming back to you and say, oh, you want that feature? You have to buy that extra piece of the system or you have to buy that. We want to provide everything out of the box for you to do your job in your particular organization. The other thing that's also very important is simplicity. And I know a lot of you are saying, simplicity, how can an ERP system be simple? And one of the things I do in front of audiences, and I'll, I'll give it a poll here real quick, is um, how many of you use email? Everybody uses email. Good. It's good to see all those hands. Now, how many of you use Outlook for your email system? All right. You guys are all in the right conference. So. All right. Now, how many of you have actually been to training on Outlook? Where's all the hands? Why haven't you been to training on Outlook? It, it's what? Speak up. That's good. Simple. Easy. Intuitive. Keep those words coming. Well, ERP can be the same way. And you say, wait a minute. How can ERP be simple? Well, think about it. What do you do? What do 80 or 85, 90% of your users in ERP do? They buy stuff. They approve stuff. They do their timesheet, 
and they do some business analytics. And I know there's some more deeper things, but that's basically what they do 90% of the time. Now you have some power users that do some other more complex stuff, but basically that's what folks do. So why not make it simple? And to demonstrate that simplicity, uh, Doug will be performing a demo later uh, this afternoon for us to actually show you various ways to use the system, whether you're at your desktop through a role center, whether you're accessing the system through the web, whether you're accessing it through an employee portal, or, get this, your executives that never like to sign onto an ERP system, but they stay in Outlook all day, well, why can't they use the ERP system through Outlook? and not have to sign on. So we're going to demonstrate how some of those functions work with Microsoft interoperability. The other thing, too, is that when we built the public sector solution, we didn't want to just make it a me too solution. You know, to say, yeah, everybody does budgetary control, or yes, we do grants management and project accounting and commitment accounting. We wanted to go beyond that. And when you look under the hood of what we produced with AX 2012, is we, we, one of the things we focused on was saying, what are our competitors and organizations struggling with when they put in competitor products? You know, for instance, let's take something simple like budgetary control. You say, well, gee, how can that be complex? But in reality, all of you have a legal budget that you have to comply with. But generally, that legal budget might be at your fund and department level. But that's kind of too hard to manage. You might want a managerial budget that's at department, division, uh, and maybe a line item of expense or, or something like that, or some category of expense. Well, can your system manage both of those budgets? It should be able to. And what if you had a project? Well, that project's probably got a budget too. Well, with AX2012, you can do all those different types of things. Also, speaking of budgetary accounting, what if you have a transaction, let's say you get an invoice and you enter it, but it hasn't been approved, or somebody's putting in a requisition, and it hasn't been you know, updated in the system, hasn't been posted yet. Do you want to subtract that from the budget? May or may not. Well, we provide those options to you out of the box with AX2012. So those are some of the distinguishing characteristics just around budgetary control. So lots and lots of flexibility. The last thing that, that I wanted to highlight here real quickly before I turn it over to our speakers has to do with business intelligence. I know a lot of you, um, you have seen vendor demos and they come in and they present their system and they show you, you know, a nice looking dashboard and say, yeah, see, we've got this, you know, and you get all this business intelligence and access to data. But re what really happens when you implement a system? You know, you go through you go through business process analysis, you build your chart of accounts, your vendor file, you convert your data, you train your people, you build the interfaces, and you do some testing, and guess what? You've run out of time, you've run out of money, and you never get those reports and those dashboards. Well, Microsoft's philosophy is, why not give you those dashboards from day one when you first sign on into the system? So the, the approach that we take is we want to provide role, we provide role centers for approximately 35 different roles out of the box that allows you to start with business intelligence and tailor those to your own specific needs. So I've talked enough about the system. Let's hear from some of our users and their experience in implementing uh, AX2012. Uh, the, my first speaker is uh, Mike Bailey. He's the director of finance and uh, information services for the city of Redmond, Washington. So I'll turn it over to Mike. Thank you, Charlie. Let's say that again. So I am the uh, CFO, and the, as a result of being the uh, chief financial officer for the city of Redmond, I also uh, have the uh, a privilege and, and enjoy very much supervising the IT function as well. Uh, Redmond, as you probably know, is the home of the Microsoft headquarters. Uh, and we'll talk more about that in just a moment. Uh, we have about 650 full-time employees, about 55,000 residents, a little shy of 90,000 jobs in the city, uh, many of those 90,000, uh, again, directly or indirectly related to, to Microsoft. So as, uh, as CFO, um, my job is to oversee all the accounting functions and, and whatnot, uh, as I said, as well as the technology. Uh, this is the kind of work I've been doing for over 30 years. I enjoy it very much. I feel very strongly about doing the things we do on behalf of our community very well. And uh, so that's part of what drives uh, our, our interest in, in having the right tools and making sure those tools are available to all of the folks in our organization that share that responsibility with me. Uh, I've been at Redmond for about four years. 
Uh, prior to my arriving at Redmond, uh, the city had implemented a J.D. Edwards solution, actually probably about seven or so years ago now. And, uh, and there was a, a lot of angst uh, with the, the way that that uh, system was serving our customers, our internal customers. It was implemented in a very centralized and locked down sort of way. Uh, our customers uh, didn't uh, have the ability to use that system to meet their needs and solve their problems. So they did what every good user will do. They created their own little subsystems, ignored the central system, just uh, you know, uh, paid homage to it only as required. Uh, they, in order to get bills paid, they had to send information in that direction, but that was uh, only to the extent that was absolutely necessary. They really did all their real work in their own systems, uh, which of course were Excel spreadsheets, backed up by file drawers uh, full of copies of invoices, and, uh, and you know what I'm talking about, that happens uh, often everywhere. And the challenge we had when, when I arrived was we had audit exceptions, um, you know, the grant reports were being completed by, uh, again, our customers using what they had at their fingertips um, inaccurately. And of course the auditors would arrive and we'd be sort of trying to sort that stuff out and they'd observe that there was these discrepancies and, and when you have multiple sources of data in the organization, you're going to have discrepancies. So there was a lot of concern about the way that a system, that system was serving our needs. Um, in fact, uh, when we got to all the people together uh, that were dealing with grants and, and talked about some of the problems they were having and the challenges they were dealing with and suggested that we were going to implement something that would uh, enable them to draw their information from a common source uh, such as an ERP system, uh, they broke out in applause. I've never had that kind of a reaction before, uh, but that indeed is what happened. I arrived at Redmond about four years ago at the behest of a, of a new mayor who had conducted a search for uh, somebody in, in my role, and I was very pleased to be able to, uh, to join the team. Uh, you know, Redmond being, again, not only the home of Microsoft, but also the location of, of other technology leaders, uh, you know, Nintendo USA, uh, AT&T Mobile, uh, and, and others uh, like them. Um, you know, we wanted to take the city forward on the technology curve. Uh, the mayor would remind us all, if he were here, that Redmond has a pioneering history. Uh, we pioneered um, in the you know, turn of the century. Uh, this is our 100th year. We pioneered in aerospace uh, with Boeing and in neighboring communities and, and uh, certainly have been pioneering in the technology world as well. Uh, so therefore, it's logical that we would be pioneering with um, this uh, ERP project at AX 2012 as well. Uh, we conducted an IT technology assessment when I arrived because there were a number of concerns about the technology systems in the city, uh, the ERP system not being the only one, but guess which one ended up being at the top of the list. The top, ERP, uh, the top need in our IT uh, scan, organizational scan, was for a new financial system. Uh, we had lots of needs. It was surprising, quite frankly, to me that this was identified by uh, our users, our customers, internal to the organization as their biggest pain point and something we needed to do something about. And we looked around for alternative solutions um, and decided that given all of the circumstances that we were facing and, and uh, it, it, all the other challenges we had with the technology needs, probably our best bet at that time was just to re-implement the same tool we had, but to do it in a very different way. And so we had made that decision and we're headed down that road uh, when I sat down with some folks, uh, both from Microsoft and also our implementation partner, uh, Tyler Technologies, and, um, and they talked to us about uh, participating in the uh, Microsoft's uh, Dynamics 2012 uh, public sector uh, implementation. And um, so we headed off on working with, uh, with uh, both Tyler and Microsoft on the TAP program probably about three years ago. And we've been involved with the development teams and implementation teams and, uh, and folks uh, all, uh, of all um, you know, so, uh, types and sorts and whatnot in this implementation. Uh, in, in our city. In fact, we had um, you know, several folks uh, from both organizations that now consider themselves full-time employees of the city of Redmond and, uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, are, you know use, wave their badge around and, and whatnot. Um, and uh, we have several um, technology labs uh, set up around the city in order to facilitate this kind of work. Internally, we turned to our customers who expressed these concerns that I talked about earlier and said, so we're going to do something different and we have a lot of additional flexibility now uh, how should we set it up so that it best meets your needs? You know, what are your needs? And, and so we really used a grassroots sort of approach and involved our end users in helping us think about the chart of accounts and, and the way to, to build a system around meeting their needs instead of the central internal needs of the finance department itself. 
And that, I think, really helped create some support for the project that we um, set out on. We reduced, I have here, by one-third our chart of accounts. I think that's drastically understating uh, how much we were able to reduce the number of accounts in the general ledger that we were using because we were able to use the project accounting functions uh, for the non-accounting type needs that folks had traditionally created a new account for. Uh, I joke that in some jurisdictions I've been, if they have a favorite tree, they decide it needs its own GL account. And um, so here instead, if they've got a favorite tree, they're welcome to that tree, but it needs to uh, now be uh, you know, tracked through a project and not through part of the general ledger. And we've reduced the general ledger um, significantly as a result of that. It really f uh, serves the accounting function and all the other functions are served through, through the project function. We built the workflows around the way they wanted to handle their processes. What was funny is several months later, when they came back and complained to us about the way the system handled processes, we said, well, how would you like it to work? And they're still trying to agree on what that would look like so we can change the workflows to accommodate their, their interests and needs. We also opened the system up. Anybody who's got a basic uh, City of Redmond account in Dynamics uh, has access to view virtually everything uh, from vendors, transactions, accounts, uh, whatever in the system. And so uh, very, very open, very different than the original system they were uh, uh, struggling with when we arrived. We wanted to continue to build support, so we had open houses. We invited those development folks that were working so hard on the TAP project in to talk to our end users. And so we had parks people and cops and firefighters and, and engineers and whatnot um, in City Hall milling around uh, demonstrations uh, about how systems uh, you know, would provide information to meet their needs. Um, and we talked a lot about the change uh, that that would uh, incur, that would put on them in terms of their roles. Uh, they would now have different information in, to work with and, and different kinds of interactions with the system. They'd have different roles. They'd have more responsibilities uh, for these kinds of uh, uh, system interaction as, as well. Uh, they'd see things in their workflow inbox that maybe they weren't used to seeing before. And so we, we spent a lot of time uh, working on that as well. And I would say as a result of all of those conversations that generally we've had a great deal of support from the uh, organization as a whole uh, with respect to this project. We went live in July of last year with a pre-release version of the, of the product. Uh, it was our production uh, uh, system, and uh, we moved to the market release version uh, around the end of last year, and, and we're now current on, on the uh, cumulative releases and, and using the current product. One of the questions I often get is, you know, are you using something, you know, some special flavor? Uh, I, I don't think so. I think we're using the, the market version that's available um, you know, to, to, uh, to others as well. And, um, we're just now beginning to look at, you know, what else can we do? And I think this conference has really been very helpful to us to help uh, us understand better uh, the, the choices that, that maybe we can go back now and revisit and, and look at um, it, it, are there ways that we can enhance the way we're using uh, the, the, the product. And, and I'm, the answer to that is surely yes. It, it's a matter of what choices do we make when and how do we continue to evolve and learn now that we have so much more uh, that we can work with. And, um, it, you know, it's a, just a matter of choices in, in seeing those things through now. So we're working with our end users to, as I said earlier, to understand, now that you understand, for instance, how workflow works and how it in, uh, interacts with you and your role, uh, is that serving your needs? Are the right people looking in the right order? Are they able to accomplish and do the right kinds of things? And so we're really working to, uh, to take advantage uh, of the resources that have been uh, given to us by virtue of this project. And I see that lasting for a long, long time. Uh, again, I've learned uh, here over the last couple of days that we're just scratching the surface. There's so much more that we could be doing, and, and it's just a matter of, of having our organization really ready to take those next steps and, uh, and embrace some things that are pretty radically different from the way we've always done it, and, uh, but certainly would uh, put us in a position to do our kinds of business uh, much better and more efficiently, which is something we're, we're always about. So uh, we're just looking for uh, more opportunities to engage with uh, more folks about uh, uh, how they're using these, these tools and, and, and products so that we can help each other get better and uh, continue to meet the needs of, of our customers. With that, Charlie, I'll turn it back to you. Give Mike a round of applause. Thank you, Mike. Our next speaker is at a different place as far as implementation. He's in the, uh, the starting phases, and our next speaker I'd like to welcome up is uh, Clark Westmoreland. Uh, assistant uh, Vice Provost. Clark? Yeah. You can't have it. Oh, okay. <laughs> no. Keep on one slide. This will go very quickly. Um, 
Clark Westmoreland, Assistant Vice Provost. Assistant Vice Provost in the university context means you're a business officer who serves in the role of CIO, CFO, and COO, and they only have to pay one person. So that's what, that's what AVP means. Uh, let's see, there we go. Who are we? UW Educational Outreach is uh, North America's largest uh, continuing education unit uh, tied to a tier one uni public university. Um, we, our student is typically 25 years old and older. So um, across 400 different programs, that includes six, uh, 61 professional uh, doctoral and, and uh, graduate level degrees, 140 certificate programs, and a, and a whole myriad of other offerings in our portfolios, we gross about $125 million a year. Uh, five years ago, we were at $60 million a year. And so in the, in the global and Puget Sound marketplace, continuing education is, is growing, to say the least. Uh, we are self-sustaining, virtually no uh, state funding. The, the, the wee bit of state funding that we still maintain, I give back to my partners as an incentive to work with us. Um, 96,000 annual enrollments were the other University of Washington. The, the, the core numbers reported at the University of Washington are about 45,000 annual enrollments. We're the other side um, of the University of Washington, the self-sustaining side. And what's interesting is we have no financial management system. Uh, as a matter of fact, Dan sitting here in the front introduced himself to me. And Dan said, yeah, I was in Seattle um, and left about early 90s, right? He goes, you guys aren't still using FAS and PAS and HES, which is the financial accounting system and the project accounting system and the payroll system. I go, yeah, we're still using FAS and PAS and HES. They're still cranking along on those, those mainframes. So we knew we needed to do something. Um, so um, the mission statement's there. I, I, won't, I won't read through it, but we are, a, we are a, um, a large CE unit that does work in the global marketplace. So um, basically, um, where, where we went with all this is we're running a $125 million business on Microsoft. Nothing wrong with Access, but it just doesn't lend itself as a general ledger, does it? Uh, and Excel attached to mainframe data sources and data warehouses was um, UW IT as a central organization uh, several years ago began, began conducting some very deep due diligence around financial management. Make a very long story very short because I sat on the steering committee um, and spent many, many hours in, in these exploratory phases. Ultimately, the university decides that um, HR payroll comes first, which uh, given compliance and other risk issues associated with human resources management and payroll, it probably wasn't a bad decision, but it left some of us big self-sustaining units hanging out there a little bit. So uh, we decided to go forward with UW IT, which is Central IT at the University of Washington and UW EO, uh, our, our, our uh, organization, and partner um, to implement a financial management system because we feel like the university itself at an enterprise class level is probably five to seven years away. Um, and we really, myself and the CIO at UW IT really needed a solution in the short term. We went through another significant due diligence process and looked, looked at Great Plains. We looked at JD Edwards. Um, we looked at, in, the, in the open consortium space, the quality space. Any of you in higher ed probably knows the word quality. It, it stands for a, a small practical kitchen device. Um, and realized we just weren't ready to, to move um, into a product that I think is still under development, but is making substantial strides. And after significant due diligence, we chose AX 2012. And so we will be the second public sector customer on AX 2012. And what was particularly appealing to us about the product, let me see if it's on the next slide, um, are, are these attributes um, that are very important to us. If you can imagine a student's, if you can imagine a classroom of students, and within that classroom, I have 10 different student demographics paying different rates um, attached to different programs, and I need to account for each of them individually. A highly flexible and dynamic chart of accounts uh, and a dimensional chart of accounts uh, in, in a GL was critical. Um, we're a Microsoft shop. We, um, in production, I run CRM 2011. I, I'm, I'm moving reporting services into production right now. We're, we're fully integrated across the dynamic stack, and so therefore AX was a logical extension of that stack. Um, 
we were very impressed um, a year ago at Convergence and in, and in earlier conversations with Microsoft around the product development cycle where, where 2012 is going. And, uh, and, we're, and it's not my job to sit here and talk about the product and all its attributes, but I can tell you this, Microsoft has done a very good job of um, addressing the needs of public sector and higher education with fund accounting and, and, and other accounting methods um, out of the box that public sector needs to, to function um, that doesn't have to be customized. And to that, to that extent, um, we were very uh, impressed by the workflow and the configurability of the software to minimize customization and the expense and risk associated with that. Uh, it, its workflow uh, was very impressive. Um, uh, and, and as I said, um, it works across the Microsoft stack and we are actually, I, we just made a decision literally before I got on the plane to move forward with BizTalk as an integration, um, as, as a middleware data bus, as, as an integration broker. Um, so where are we? Well, this is, these are the live components and I won't sit here and read through this, but it's in the presentation and I, it's in many of Microsoft's collaterals, but they've done, a, they've done a really great job at the, at the top layer there around public sector uh, applications. So we, we also, one thing I do want to talk about though is one of the other key attributes that we were looking for in, um, in, in, a, in a software product was, and where AX was very appealing, was in its inherent parent and subsidiary um, relational capability. Uh, because AX, AX serves itself very well in, in the multinational corporate marketplace. And if you look at a large university, the University of Washington is a $3.3 billion enterprise. Every, about two billion of that is research and medicine and about, about 900 million is, is academia. Every school and college each research unit, each medical unit, behaves very much as an autonomous business with, with, different, um, with different GL needs, different reporting needs, different workflow, different business rules. And so as we were looking at products, knowing right now we're just implementing at the department level of IT and EO, um, we saw a product that could report up to a central up, up to, a central, up to a centralized data layer, but at the same time be implemented as two different subsidiaries that do have different GL pro process needs, reporting and workflow needs. For example, we are, we're implementing about 63 of AX's processes. IT is implementing 122. That, in, that includes service management and fulf order fulfillment and fixed assets that we don't need to implement because we're, uh, we're, we're uh, in the academic space and they're more in the services space. So it was pretty cool that it was a tool that loaned itself to two very different business entities of a university, a services organization and an educational organization, but at the same time can share common integration and at the same time can roll up for common reporting needs. So it was very, very appealing as a product within, um, within those, those business requirements. So uh, here we are. Um, We've chosen Tectora. Hello, Mark. I see you there. Mark Anderson of Tectora is in the audience. Uh, we are deep in the analysis phase right now, looking at our two businesses and looking at the processes that we share. Um, we, we've, we will go through a, um, a design phase where we'll begin prototyping and, and on through into implementation. Um, let's see. Um, we are 120 processes across GL, AP, AR, cost accounting, project accounting, fixed assets, service management, um, and uh, we're planning to go live in December 2012. So there you have it. Thanks. Thanks, Mike Clark. Appreciate it. Okay, now that, now that you've heard from uh, uh, two of our users, what I'd like to do is uh, bring up Doug Bell and uh, Doug is going to give us a, uh, an overview of interoperability of uh, Microsoft Dynamics AX 2012. So we're not going to be f focusing so much on features and functions of public sector, but showing you different ways to actually access the system and get data back out. So turn it over to Doug. Great. Thanks, Charlie. Seeing as this is the uh, last demo of the day, I have a very distinct challenge in trying to show you something new. So hopefully we'll see something new. And as Charlie mentioned, what we're really going to focus, we keep this at a high level, and we want to talk about different modes of access and interoperability with other Microsoft products and technologies. 
So by now, I'm sure you're all aware that we have a desktop application. And along with that desktop application, there are about 35 role centers that are delivered out of the box and all the value and how easy that makes the product to use. So I won't bore you with uh, reiterating all of those themes. But what we're looking at here, I'm logged in as Ken, and Ken is a controller for the city of Maple. So as a controller, Ken's more interested in consuming data, primary, primary, primarily related to how is the city doing financially. That's great. If I were logged in as an AP person, perhaps my role center is more oriented towards what sort of tasks do I need to complete today. So you're familiar with the concept of role centers, the different features of the role centers, and how they uh, pertain to different roles within the organization. So we have the desktop application, and that's a very effective and efficient way to ap access the application. Well, let's say you need more mobility. You don't want a desktop application. OK, no problem. You can access this same role center through the web. So now I'm in Internet Explorer. I'm looking at that same role center. I get the same kind of privileges to access the same information, and I'm doing so in a fashion where I can access it from anywhere through Internet Explorer or Safari, if you must, whatever your, your, whatever your web browser may be. <clears throat> Well, now let's say I'm a more casual user, and I only need to be able to perform self-service type of functions. So I don't need a very elegant role center to do that. I need a more streamlined self-service portal. So I'm sure most of you have probably seen the self-service portal by now as well. This is nice. I can do expense reports. I can manage my approvals. I can manage my team. I can manage my personal data. You're familiar with the type of, of, of functions that can be performed through the employee self-service portal. Well, now let's take it one step, one step further and say that I want to be able to perform some of these functions let's say some self-service functions, and I don't even want to have to go open up a web browser in order to do so. So I'm a manager, I spend all my day in Outlook, I'm answering emails, I'm looking at my schedule, I want to be able to do some of these tasks in Outlook. Okay, great, we can do that too. So let's take the example of workflow approvals. I'm a manager, one of my employees submits a purchase request, I get an email alert telling me that a request has been assigned to me for review and approval. So I get information about the specifics of that request, who submitted it, who is it on behalf of, what are they requesting, what's the approximate value of that request. There's a link to the form. If I use the desktop ap application, I can use that link to open up the form and take action in that method. Or let's say I don't even want to leave Outlook. I can actually just come down here to my AX work list. Now I'm still working in Outlook, and I'm actually looking at my approval queue directly from within the Outlook application. So now I can see that same work item, and I can actually take action on it. So I can open this purchase requisition. I can review all the details associated with it, all the line item details, see the budget that it's being charged to, make sure that it's passing all the budget checks and things of that nature. And directly from within Outlook, I can approve this. I can reject this. I can delegate it to another person for, to review it as well. Any type of action I might need to take, I can do so directly from within my Outlook application. Another thing I can do within Outlook is expense reports. Say I don't want to open up a web page to submit my expense report or my request for travel approval. Well, I can do all of that from within Outlook as well. I can manage my travel requisitions for pre-approval. I can manage my expense reports. So here I'm looking at a draft expense report that I've been working on. I can attach receipts. I can print a cover sheet for this with the barcode. Anything related to this expense report, I can actually perform directly from within the Outlook application. One more thing that in this particular example I'm enabled to do through Outlook is view certain reports. So you know how you can get to reports through those links on your desktop application, but let's say I want an even more convenient mode to access those reports. I can actually access them through Outlook. I can schedule this report to be published or refreshed on a periodic basis. And while I'm still within that Out Outlook application, I can access my favorite reports. So now we've looked at using the desktop. We've used that looking Internet Explorer for more mobility. We've also looked at accessing and performing certain functions through Outlook for increased efficiency. Now let's talk a little bit about Excel. So there's a couple different ways in which I can use Excel. Now I can use Excel to produce data. I'm going to focus more on using Excel to consume data. And I'm going to use a couple different examples here. Well, let's say that Ken was asked to do some analysis on grants that were awarded this year. The first thing he's going to do is come back to his desktop application and he's going to see his queue here. So he sees that there's three grants that were awarded this year for $12 million and change. Well, he wants to get more information about these. So he's going to drill down on his queue, and he's going to access the list page. I'm sure you're all familiar with list pages. And we have the preview pane, the fact boxes, lots of good information about this particular grant record or any of the grant records within this list. Now let's say I want to be able to do some more advanced analysis. So Ken can choose to export this list to Excel. Once he has it in Excel, he can use any of the data from the list page. If he didn't find information, he could add columns to that. I'm sure you're familiar with how you can personalize the grid pages and add columns and pull in more data. 
But the really slick thing about this is once he exports that data to Excel, he can manipulate it, he can build pivot tables, he can do all the sorts of analysis he needs to do, and then next month or six months from now when he's asked to do that same type of analysis, he can simply use the Dynamics AX tab and refresh all of this data just like that. It's going to pull in the new data and all the analysis and the pivot tables or whatever sort of uh, investment he made in this particular spreadsheet are all kept intact and it still has that relationship with the source data to facilitate the refresh of that data. So that's one example of how he can use Excel. Now let's take an example where he wants to do a little more advanced, more general ledger type analysis. And to do that, he's going to use the SQL Server Analysis Services cubes. So he's going to access an existing connection, and he's going to plug into the general ledger cube. In this case, Ken was just asked to do some fairly standard budget versus actual analysis, and he wants to analyze his budget numbers versus his actual spending, and he's going to do so using a couple different dimensions and uh, have a couple different views of that same set of data. So once he accesses his cube, he's going to focus on ledger balances, and he's going to analyze these numbers by department and by fund. So he's going to pull in a couple of key dimensions that he's going to use to slice and dice the data. And then he's going to pull in the budget total and the actual total. So now he's looking at budget versus actual. He can insert another column here, budget minus actual equals available. He can do lots of fancy formatting in Excel. I won't demonstrate Excel for you. But now what he's looking at is what I would refer to as a decentralized view of the data, where he has summary totals by department, itemized line items by fund. Great. Now let's say Ken needs to switch this to a more centralized view. So he wants to get summary totals by fund. So does he have to call IT? Does he have to put in a formal request for another report to be built? No, of course not. He's working with a pivot table. Any of you that are familiar with it, you can switch the order of precedence of the two dimensions that I'm using to do analysis. And now Ken's looking at a more centralized view where he has summary totals by fund and detailed line items by department. So there's a couple key points here. One, of course, at any given time, I can refresh this and it's going to pull in the current data from the cube. Another key point when I'm doing all this analysis in Excel is that it's using Windows security Active, Direc Active Directory authentication. It knows who I am. And using the application security settings associated with my user, it knows what type of data I have access to see. So you don't have to be concerned about circumventing all your application security, hitting the database directly, and getting access to data that you shouldn't be. Through the interoperability, uh, all those types of security settings are intact, and they are all referenced. So now we've used the desktop application, we've used the web, we've used Outlook, we've used Excel. Let's go back to the desktop application and just run through a couple more neat things that Ken can do. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about search capabilities. Uh, most ERP systems have a search capability. That's great. So I can search for, oh, let's say I search for a term like audit. Now when I search for audit, I would expect to see a list of pages that have to do with it, audit policies, audit trail, audit cases, things of that nature. These are forms, resources within the application itself. On the right here, I see a list of help files associated with it. All very valuable information, all valuable search results. <clears throat> now let's say Ken gets a voicemail from a gentleman named Oliver. And Oliver is asking about a purchase order or an invoice, but he's not exactly sure what the inquiry is about. But he knows it's financial related, so he's going to search for Oliver using that same enterprise search capabilities. And this enterprise search is built on SharePoint. So it not only searches through help files and a list of forms within the application, it can actually search through data within the application as well. And it can search through documents that you have on a SharePoint share. There's, there's really a lot of capability and power behind this enterprise search. And what he found when he searched for Oliver was he got a hit on a vendor record. And the vendor is called City Power and Light. And I call it Oliver, so I was curious how Oliver is related to this particular vendor record. Now, when he opens up the vendor form, he might notice that Oliver has actually been identified as a contact for this vendor record. So you can see the power of the enterprise search capabilities where he, we, he was able to take a term or a name like Oliver and identify the vendor record that Oliver is associated with. Now, if he wants more information about Oliver or his company, he could actually look at the address information or what's more valuable, let's actually map the address. And those of you that have used being maps at all, you know, you can map an address. You can zoom in on a little bit. You can flip it to a bird's eye view. And from that pin, you see, oh, OK, Oliver's company must have something to do with the Astros. You know, their address has been at Made Field. Pretty neat. Pretty sweet baseball field. Okay. Now, 
the, now that Ken's identified Oliver and his association with this particular vendor record, he decides that he needs to follow up. And instead of doing that himself, he's going to ask the, ask the expert in the matter, the person that has more insight into the relationship with Oliver to follow up with him. And that person would be the employee responsible for Oliver. So if Ken wants to communicate with April, he might look her up in the directory, he might pick up the phone and try to get a hold of her, or he could use link. So directly from within the application, he can send an instant message and initiate a collaboration session with April using the link communication tool. So of course he can IM her, he can call her, he can do a video chat, he can share his desktop if they need to talk about a purchase order. So essentially he can initiate a collaboration session with April directly from within the application. So that was just a neat little scenario where he was able to take one little piece of information, use the enterprise search, identify the vendor record, and then actually interact with the vendor record and other employees all from that one little piece of information. I think we have time for one more scenario. So another scenario that I think is, that I think is neat is using the org chart and the visual mapping of the organization. So I'm going to open up the org chart. And let's take a scenario. Usually I pick on HR, so I'm going to pick on finance this time. But let's say Ken was asked to do a reorganization. And he was asked to reorganize in a fashion where the finance department will actually report back to the HR department. So the first thing he wants to do is map his organization, and I'm sure you all have seen the org hierarchy, and my resolution is really low, so it's being cut off. But you can see how there is a finance department and a human resource department. And if he focuses in on the finance department, he can see that there are child organizations associated with it, of course. So in order to do a reorg, does he want to pick up all six, seven, eight of these organizations and move them individually? I mean, he could, but wouldn't it be nice if he could just do it all at once? Well, he can't, so he, he can edit this, and then refocus on the finance department. And instead of moving each of these organizations individually, he can right click and cut the parent organization. And now focus back in on the human resource department and paste the finance department into the human resource department. And just like that, he was able to do a complete reorganization of the parent organization and all the child organizations and have them now roll up to the human resource department. So this is another example of how we're leveraging Microsoft technologies. I think I've heard that this is built on the Visio platform. Uh, so just another example of how we provide multiple modes of access and uh, have enabled interoperability to just com to further extend the, the diversity in fashions in which you can access the application and interact with the application. Don't go away yet, Doug. Oh, okay. I, I got a challenge for you. Go, go back to the Role Center page on your desktop. We're going off script. What's that? Yes. <laughs> this, this is way off script here. That means we got an extra minute. You know, on this Role Center page, you know, one of the things the claims is made is that users can easily tailor the screen. So let's say in these queues that you've got up here, let's say you want to add an additional queue. Okay. What, what's the process I'd go through? Well, I would start by clicking Add Queue. <laughs> Gee, how novel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so certainly. Let's say Ken wants to keep a closer eye on accounts receivable. So he's going to add a queue for customer invoices past due. And associated with that, he wants to see the total dollar amount of invoices that are past due. He can add his new queue. And these are, what I was picking from are the list of queues that are delivered out of the box. I think there's about 100 of them or so. If you're not familiar with it, from any list page within the application, you can do an advanced query and build your own queues. And you can put them on your own role page, or you can make them public, so you can share them with other people's role centers. So there's a lot of flexibility in, uh, in being able to personalize these role centers. I have a new queue. Customer invoices past due. 14 for $35,000 and change. Wow. Pretty impressive. Good job. <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. <laughs>